good, we're on. Hello, everyone. Um, I'm going to first introduce the topic, just starting my timer, um, and then I'm going to introduce our lovely panelists. So um, why don't you guys have a seat? I'll sit in one sec. Um, so um, the, we're talking about the, ri the, the digital and sharing economies today. And um, you know, the rise of these economies um, is really transforming how we do business and really transforming how we um, you know, live our lives as consumers. And um, because of the prevalence of the digital economy, um, it's even becoming you know, harder and harder to delineate it from traditional economies. And um, you know, studies show that the digital economies are far outpacing the growth of traditional economies. And I'm sure that's very obvious to all of you, especially after some of the speakers we had um, earlier today. Um, the sharing economy um, has such a global presence that a recent Nielsen Global um, survey said that 68% of people said that they're willing to share their assets for financial gain, and 66% say that they're willing to use or rent products and services from others in a sharing community. And this is only going to increase because half of those people are millennials. So um, the three of us spoke, and um, we got together, and we realized that there's a lot of overlap between digital and sharing economy. So the discussion is kind of going to cover both throughout um, and go a little bit all over the place. So you know, hang with us. Um, today, I have with me um, Rochelle Parham and Bob Adams, and they both have really unique perspectives on the digital and sharing economies. Um, Rochelle is the former CMO of eBay, um, where she led global brand strategy, brand marketing, and internet marketing. Um, her background includes many aspects of consumer and digital marketing throughout her career at eBay, Visa, Digitas, and Citibank, and she was actually um, uh, voted uh, Forbes 12th most influential CMO, um, and Fast Company highlighted her as one of the most creative people in business, so she's, she's one of my, my people. <laughs> <laughs> um, Bob and I actually have crossed paths before, um, and uh, Bob's the Senior Director of Global Insights at Visa, where he spearheads efforts to really maintain um, customer-centric culture. Um, and to drive engagement and creative brand, create brand value. And his background includes extensive qualitative and quantitative methods in his roles at Visa, Price Waterhouse, the Capital Group, and American Express. So um, we're really happy to have these two folks with us. And um, what we're going to do is we're going to ask each of them to just sort of um, start with a few minutes on their perspective, um, just sort of overall on the topic. And then I've got some questions for them. And then we'll save some time for questions from the audience. So would you like to start, Rochelle? Great, sure. So so I thought I'd kick us off and just talk a little bit about the sharing economy. And you know, so when I you just do some research on it uh, and you look at some of the numbers today, what you find is there's about 9,000 startups that are kind of just in this space. And when you think about kind of what that means, these are the companies that are out there trying to disrupt, disrupt traditional uh, traditional companies. And so that's one big piece of data. The other big piece of data is that they're across about 12 different industries or so, maybe a bit more, but they've been funded with about $11 billion in funding. Like, I mean, these are big, big numbers for some of these small companies. Uh, and so when I, when I think about what this ends up looking like, it makes me think about eBay. So you guys know I was at eBay for four and a half years, and I want to just give a shout out to every person who has mentioned eBay today. <laughs> I've heard it a lot. It makes me feel really, really good. It makes me think that the work I did for those years paid off. So keeping it top of mind uh, in this room with all you brilliant people is pretty cool for me, so thank you. Uh, but when you think about eBay, eBay started 20 years ago. The 20-year anniversary is uh, Labor Day of this year. And, um, and this company, when it started, was all about kind of this sharing economy, right? So when you think about the companies that started back then 20 years ago, a lot of them don't even exist, right? And so eBay said, you know what? There's all these people who have inventory, like stuff, and there's all these people who want stuff, like we all want stuff. Um, and why don't we have, create a platform that brings these folks together, that allows the person who has the stuff and the person that wants the stuff to actually have a transaction powered by eBay. Uh, but the other piece of this story is it allowed you to actually rate each other, right? Like, that was awesome, he sucked, that was great, whatever, right? And so when you look now at these different marketplaces, these different shared economy businesses, it's all based on that same model from 20 years ago. 
Um, and it's just getting better and better and better. But what's been what's interesting about it now is that what you're seeing is you're seeing it for services, you're seeing it for education, you're seeing it for transportation. So you're seeing it all over the place. And so um, really proud to have been a part of that. But what's been interesting for me, at least for the last couple of months uh, since leaving eBay, and having all these great conversations with all these marketplace-focused companies and shared economy-focused companies, is they're all putting a little twist on it that's so interesting. So you think about the TaskRabbits or the Ubers or uh, new companies like Shuttle. There's so many different approaches to how do you kind of build an ecosystem that brings folks together and allows people to make a whole bunch of money uh, based on excess inventory. So very cool. Great, thank you. Bob? So, uh, uh, you know, in working at Visa, I, I've been there for the past 14 months and I'm, some of you may not think of Visa as being at the center of this whole digital um, evolution or revolution that's, that we're undergoing right now, but we actually are. Um, and so I live daily in, in what does this whole emergence uh, and transformation mean, uh, particularly to our company, but to the consumer landscape in general around the globe. And as we came together to start talking about our session today, I also, the researcher deep down inside of me, was curious to know um, just you know, where did this sort of originate from, the digital economy? And what I found was that that word or that terminology came into our discourse over 20 years ago, which was kind of surprising to me that it's been around for that long. And uh, I think that, you know, 20 years ago, it was probably about something a little bit different. And I don't think that people necessarily saw what it was going to become today uh, and what it is now as it's evolving and taking shape. And it's also a huge factor now that really is so tied to our economy overall and to the world economy as well. And in some ways, I think, could become uh, the biggest economic force that, that we will see um, in some of our lifetimes. The other thing that's interesting, I think, is the whole sharing economy and how that's a, an aspect or an element of the digital economy. I think the digital economy is, is quite uh, encompassing of, of many facets of of this uh, evolution that we're seeing take shape right now. And um, I, I think it will, be, uh, it will be interesting as we get further into the discussion to talk about some of the underpinnings for um, just what's motivating this and what some of the insights are that we're seeing um, that's helping this force take shape. Great. Well, thank you. And that was a great lead into my first question, which is from your perspective, you know, what are the, um, the consumer insights behind the digital and sharing economies? You want to start off? Sure. Um, so, well, millennials definitely. I mean, I think we and we've heard that so far today. Millennials are are are, are I think at the um, you know sort of the, the foundation for this change. And at at a really high level, one of the things that we have kind of tapped into with the millennial generation related to to the whole digital evolution is this notion that there's a better way. So millennials aren't really at least the way we see them and the way or the way that we hear them and understand them is that there's a better way for things to be done and we're not going to stick with the old ways anymore we're going to challenge it and question it and find those better ways to do things and so as new apps come online and new new service offerings come uh, they're the first to jump onto these and adopt them and try them out and experiment with them because it, it kind of sits with that um, sort of like higher order insight there are other insights that I think come, you know, sort of deeper under that and, and, and ladder up to that. And one of them that we look at is fast laning. And fast laning is, is a trend that we've been looking at for a while. And it's, it's related to be, you know, just as you would think it would be, as being in the fast lane. Is how can I get things done really rapidly and quickly? And that's, that's what people talk about is that kind of like magical Uber moment so that when you're done, you leave the, you know, the car and the, you know, the, the, the transportation itself took the form of a really kind of pleasant conversation with somebody and, you know, you learned about how do they become an Uber driver and why. And, uh, but when you leave, there's no awkward money moment, as we call it anymore. When you're getting out of a taxi in New York, you know, 10 or 15 years ago, it was like, okay, I got to pay cash. Do I have enough money in my pocket? And then, oh, how much tip? And I'm trying to calculate, and was he really good or not? Or the pizza delivery person is the other one. It's like, you know, removing that awkwardness from, from the transaction is something I think that's really transformed that experience for consumers. Um, and, and those, I think, are some of the things that we're seeing, um, that, we're, that we're starting to look at. Okay, so 
So, and what about for you, Rochelle, some of the under, underlying consumer insights that you sort of see around digital and sharing? So how I think about it, and, uh, and a lot of marketers think this way too, is, um, is finding a way to meet an unmet need. Uh, and so when you look at a lot of these different companies, it's all about how do I fill a gap, a void that exists today so that people can kind of either be more effective or get things done a lot quicker or um, say, um, create kind of more opportunity for them, create mon opportunities for them in, to make money. And so there's just all these new businesses that I see, particularly in this space, are trying to fill a need or a gap. You know, so there's one um, that I recently kind of heard about, which is uh, called Shuttle, and uh, S-H-U-T-T-L-E, and it's about helping parents. It's so simple. It's exactly, if you're a parent out here, it's exactly what you've always wanted, which is you can't leave work at three o'clock, and your kid has to get from school to soccer practice, or from the babysitter to ballet, right? And Shuttle picks up your kid and takes it to ballet. Like, typically, you find some you know, 16 year old kid who you don't even know if she can really drive well, uh, and you let her take your kid there, right? Like, so these are services that are filling a need that allow you to kind of continue what you were doing or just help you in some way. And so I, f I feel like that's what it's all about. The challenge is, is, is it niche, right? Mm -hmm. Or will it really pick up? And one of the things that we were talking about is, um, uh, I, I like to think of Silicon Valley is like a little lab experiment. So a lot of these startups start in the valley and they test it on us. So I live in Palo Alto and every single one of these little startups I can do right now at my house. Um, and we're like lab experiments. But what's so interesting is a lot of these things won't scale in the middle of the country. Like they just won't. They'll scale on the edges, but they won't scale in the center. And it's because our needs are very different. And so what ends up happening is they end up being companies for the Valley and not going anywhere else. Mm -hmm. And so you know, a lot of things that you need to think about and a lot of these companies need to understand is um, the Valley doesn't represent everyone. The Valley is actually so much more advanced because we get to see it all. Mm -hmm. uh, and so as a test bed, uh, we may not be the right test. Right, right. And what do you think, I mean, so you know, these this, this, this sharing economy, I mean, it's just exploded. I mean, what, what's behind that? You know, what's really, what's really driving that? Yeah, I think, um, I think probably one of the things, I think one of the things that enabled the explosion to take place, um, you know, maybe the two things, I think the consumer demand is one thing as people are starting to think about ways to help solve problems or, so, you, know, pro, you know, deliver um, things that people need and want. Um, and one of the things that fueled that was big data. It was the ability to capture the data, but, and it was the ability to develop the algorithms and the software that would enable the coming together of those systems. So to be able to be, you know, like the Uber platform, to be able to be in San Francisco and some in the car, there has to be something going on really pretty like powerful and complicated in the back end to be able to know there's people here who need cars, this is where the car should start circulating, you know, so the driver knows where they're supposed to be to be able to get the traffic. Um, that's going to be coming in, and the other platforms that are like that as well. The valet model, you know, where the person shows up to, to valet park your car, and then you're across town, and you say, "Oh, but deliver my car now to this other address." So I think all those kinds of models all rely on these kinds of really sophisticated levels of, and and that's one of the things that I think is a big change where it's not about um, it's not about anymore owning the inventory um, of of cabs or cars or. Because right, Uber doesn't own any cars at all. They don't even have you know the people aren't even employees of Uber, um, and Airbnb the same thing. They don't own any real estate at all. So I, I think that 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 thin layer, which is is the app that sits on top of the inventory, um, is where the profit is coming from now. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I agree with that comment. You know, so when I think about kind of the power of the data, we spend a lot of time talking about how you leverage data. I mean, some of the the things that we think about is. Um, they are kind of what data do we actually need? How are we going to use it? And how does it help? How do we optimize it to make the experience better for kind of both sides of the party and both sides of the equation? And if we keep using Uber as the example, right? So you you got us started on the you know there's a demand. Uh, we send a car there. 
Um, but if there's even heightened demand, what you see is the prices go up, mm -hmm. right? So we've all experienced surge pricing, right? Surge pricing can be crazy. Um, in Boston, it's always two times, but in other places, it could be three or four. Like, you know, surge pricing is all about demand in that area, which means that a whole bunch of cars show up, and here you go. Mm -hmm. But when the demand kind of goes down, the prices go back down, mm -hmm. and, you know, the Uber driver can actually go home and have dinner with his family. So it's so interesting how they're able to actually leverage the data to, um, to determine prices, to determine kind of the experience, mm -hmm. and um, to create kind of a, a more excitement around what the product is. And so, you know, a really relevant example for me, I have a guy who um, was my taxi driver in San Francisco, and he um, was my taxi driver for years. And you know, I had to go to the airport, I'd call him, he'd give me a ride. Um, so I was in the city, I called him, and he came to pick me up, and he had a black car. I was like, whoa, what's up? He had, on a he had a black car and a black suit. And I was like, what's going on? And he said, you know what? I bought this, um, it was a SUV, a black SUV. And he said, I've become an Uber driver. And I was like, really? And he said, number one, I can make more money. Number two, um, I determine my hours. Uh, and, um, and I actually can create real experiences for people. Uh, and so I thought about that for him, and I actually think that that was the right trajectory for him and what he was doing just because of the experiences I had with him myself. Um, but what I saw was you know, someone who actually saw the promise of the model yeah. and changed his whole business around, bought a different car, like all of these things to, to uh, create this new kind of life for himself. Yeah, yeah, and it's like either he bought the car because he had already started having some success or he invested That's basically exactly because right. he, he saw the you know the potential there. That's exactly right. um, I, I was ahead, just going to add one thing. I, I think the other thing that, that's kind of contributing to all of this is there's this, this changing sense about what it is that I can have access to and what I should have access to. If you think about 20 years ago, people, you know, not everyone, it was it was maybe more uncommon to have these kinds of services available, because Uber is almost like you have a private, private driver at your disposal, right? And I grew up in New York, and the people who lived in New York who had private drivers and had a housekeeper at their house who did the laundry and, you know, did the grocery shopping and prepared the food and things like that were people who were really affluent. And so I think there's this democratization of those kinds of services so that now they're available and they're really affordable to everybody. Um, and in particular, I mean, we do have the Silicon Valley effect. Um, I live in San Francisco. And, you know, I, I sometimes talk to my friends on the East Coast about these things, or, in, or, or maybe more in the Midwest, and I'm like, I don't know what you're talking about. We don't have that here. We don't have that in New York yet. And I'm like, really? But I, I think that these things that, you know, through, the, through your day-to-day -day life that you have access to now, I think this is another thing where uh, that, that's a big piece of what's fueling all of this, just to be able to, you know, go on and look and see what, what, what are some of the menu items available today from Munchery that, that's being served up by, you know, the local chef who I like with using local ingredients that I can have delivered to my door, you know, tonight for dinner. It's like room service comes to your door or, you know, getting your laundry picked up and it goes out and it's cleaned and washed and it comes back all folded in a nice package. And it's just, it's all done in an app. And it's just, I think that having these things available and, and at a price point that is, is, um, is very affordable is another thing that's just really, um, making making this transformation happen. Mm -hmm. yeah. and, and broadly, I mean, how would you say that the digital and sharing economies are really impacting our culture from your perspective? I think it's um, putting anything at our disposal. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I think Bob nailed it. It's really putting anything at our disposal. If if we want it, we can actually have it mm -hmm. right now. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we can call and you know, have something delivered from Best Buy right at this moment from you know, five different delivery services and they'll show up in 30 minutes right here and bring it to this stage. I mean, uh, we can actually have whatever we want. And then you know, I think about kind of all of the kind of subcultures that have been created around some of these too. So you know, there's a company, Breeze, that supplies cars. So you don't have a car or you don't want to use your car, they'll supply a car for you to use uh, so you can uh, be an Uber driver. Or Evolve, which is a company that has um, a service that uh, that manages all of your listings on HomeAway or Airbnb and all of these things. So there's all these like sub -com companies that have formed around many of these companies. And we saw it at eBay 20 years ago where we have these kind of great sellers who decided that, you know what, I'm gonna teach selling. And I, have, I had sellers who could fill a room, thousands of people, for a seminar, and they're making a, you know, a whole lot of money mm -hmm. teaching people how to sell on eBay. And you know, there's the eBay for Dummies book, you know, because people can make money on teaching people how to be a part of the economy. It's, it's fascinating. 
uh, just real quick, talk about um, getting what you want whenever you want. Yeah. If anybody forgot to send their mother anything for Mother's Day, order the chocolate strawberries from Pro Flowers. I did that because it's coming up and I know it's going to be here. So. <laughs> Go ahead. Well, I think the other thing it's doing is it helps us um, to utilize underutilized assets. Mm -hmm. And the example for me there is, I think it's the app is called Liquid Space, and it was developed by one of the um, managers of a Marriott property, I think. And she realized that there's, there's this incredible asset, which is their conference asset, that is kind of sitting vacant for most of the time. And she would notice that guests in the hotels were kind of like looking around trying to find space where they could camp out and work. So they would go in the lobby or the coffee shop and they'd try to set up their computer and they'd be making calls and things like that. And so she connected that to the empty conference space and then Liquid Space was born out of that so that it's a way to be able to source and find um, you know, office space on a temporary basis mm -hmm. when you're kind of a road warrior, I guess. And um, so it, I think that's one of the things. And the other thing I think is, um, What's interesting to me is what, what's happening to uh, the employment landscape. Because you, you, know, you have all these people now who are, and yesterday the woman who, who brought me um, in an Uber t over to the hotel, you know, I was talking to her and how she got started and, and hearing her story. She does different kind of day part activities like that. So she's an Uber driver for part of the time, but then she has other, other things like this where she's plugged in doing things. But she doesn't have like a job that she goes to nine to five mm -hmm. um, where she's paid a salary and where she's an employee of a company. And I think she, to me, represents the kind of changing landscape. It's almost like we're moving, the digital economy comes with something that's called the gig economy. Because it's like I'm just, I'm working a gig and then I have to go to my next gig later. So I think that's another, I think that's another um, kind of change yeah. that's going along with Big this. Creating freedom, independence, mm -hmm. and kind of this self-employed, right? It's um, right. creating this new breed of self-employed. We right. saw it at eBay, obviously, but um, it's a, it's a different landscape today. Right. Interesting. Um, what about um, you know? So we're talking a lot about the consumers and the culture and you know people, but what about the impact on big business? A big business. So, um, well, it's definitely, so for Visa, it's having a big impact on our business. And um, I think that we see there's so much opportunity out there. And one of the ways I think that it's, it's having impact on, on business is, and I mean, it, and it's hard to isolate the impact it's having on business from the, the impact it has on consumers. And so I, I think about, I, last July I spent three weeks in East Africa doing ethnographies in people's homes and really understanding how, what they think about you know, money and how they use money. And this is one of the places where you know, this has been su such a big transformation in the way people use money and the way they, they um, complete transactions, pay and get paid. Um, and mobile money is the thing and M-Pesa is the, the company that, that really brought this to market in, in Kenya. So I think that that has had, um, you know, a very profound f effect on on how big business operates, at least through our lens, and what mm -hmm. that means to us. Because you know, just looking at a mobile carrier who came in to sort of, and they displaced the bank. So the people's first point of relationship, uh, and the bottom line is, it's include it's including people in the financial system, which I think is is an incredible thing. But um, it wasn't the banks that did it, right? You know, there was a, somebody earlier made the point about the, the banks are sort of the lower end of the spectrum, right? There's Anne, I think. And, you know, you, it's like true, and they're, they're like disconnected, and that's partly why they're, they're at the lower end of the spectrum, because they weren't the ones who figured that out and come in and make the solution, and now they're trying to play catch up and get integrated back into that process again. Um, but even beyond that, if you look, like, look at the car industry, you, know, you mentioned about the car sharing platforms, I think that's, that's you know, another kind of like wave. You, know, you have a, this asset, again, is sitting there un underutilized, and how can you have it make money for you when you're not driving it? And then you look at a company like BMW, who is now you know, actively trialing something called Drive Now, um, which is about their, you know, their electric vehicles and, and how they can time source those. Because uh, it used to be that they would try to figure out how, you know, we're just producing these electric vehicles, how can we sell a thousand of them? And now they're saying, well, we have one electric vehicle, how can we get a thousand people to start sharing that one vehicle? Um, so it's, for them to be taking a look at, you know, that completely, completely disrupts their business model. Um, but again, I think it's being connected to where the market is going. 
Yeah, I think that's a great point. I think you know the challenges that uh, big business have is all around disruption. Mm -hmm. It's about kind of companies who are reinventing kind of the way that these big companies actually do things. And so, you know, there's, for instance, you talked about banking. Banking is a, a great example, you know, where millennials have no desire to walk into a branch, like no desire at all. Um, I barely walk into a branch, but, you know, I know my mom goes to the branch all the time, right? And so when you think about kind of di di just different generations and how they um, think about um, the traditional models versus kind of the, the um, this technologies that's available to them, um, they're going to obviously move toward the technology. And so you look at you know some of these companies like SoFi that are kind of reinventing how you think about your student loan and how you pay that off, and reinventing how you think about personal loans and why would you ever go to a bank, uh, and you know even Lending Tree and, and all and all of those companies. So it's really thinking about how the customer actually wants to um, to partner or how the customer wants to communicate and then creating a way that it actually is more comfortable for them. And that's why you know, this disruption continues to happen. So for big brands, it's all about continuing to reinvent yourself. It's understanding the customers you have today and the customers you want for tomorrow and what's the gap and how do you actually bridge the gap to actually get to the customer for tomorrow. You know, at, at eBay, the challenge was um, making sure that we were relevant for millennials. So we spent a lot of time researching millennials. Mm -hmm. And what we found is millennials shop differently. Uh, they spend a lot of time shopping after 11 p.m. <laughs> right? I mean, so, you know, many of us, we're not doing that. We're shopping, you know, can, maybe when we get home, maybe at lunch break. These kids are, you know, on their computers at 11 p.m. And it's not even their computer. They're on their tablet. Mm -hmm. Uh, and they might look at stuff in the middle of the day, but they're actually making the transaction after 11 p.m. So if I send you a deal at 9 a.m. and you're a millennial, you're not even going to see it. You're, you're not, you didn't even wake up, right? Like, and so I need to send you the deal at maybe 11 or midnight because you're actually, that's when you're actually going to be paying attention. And so we actually have to think about things a yeah. lot differently uh, just by studying the behaviors and understanding kind of what was the big difference and adjusting the marketing to... Um, to meet their needs. Yeah, that's great. Um, this may be a kind of a hard one, but are, are there any industries that you think are just completely missing the boat? I, I don't, well, I'm not sure if they're missing the boat, but they just haven't gotten on to the steamship yet. <laughs> um, the, uh, so, I mean, I think that they're, you know, I think about the street vendors, like a lot, you know, like the street vendors are the shoes, like as I had my shoes shined in the airport, um, I was traveling early, so, and I didn't have any cash, because I don't care, who carries cash anymore, right? And you work for Visa, you better not carry cash. <laughs> I work for Visa. <laughs> cash is the enemy. Right, exactly. <laughs> and I was like, isn't there like a Good shoe job. shine app that I can pay you with? Um, so I had to go and find an ATM to get some cash to pay the guy. But so I think that they're, you know, and like the, the interesting thing I think too is like, you know, like when you go to a country like India, and we're, we've been testing some some new uh, a new technology um, that, that, that we'll, we're launching very soon um, in India, and in Bangalore, for example, you know, have the tuk-tuk drivers, and, and they're going around. They only take cash. That's the only means to pay. And even when you look at like um, Snapdeal or Flipkart or, or Amazon now, which moved, has moved into that market. It's still a cash on demand kind of business. So, you know, Amazon had to adapt their business model when they went to India to, to facilitate cash on demand. So when you deliver it, you get cash. Um, and 90% of the, the exchange happens in cash in India still. So this is a huge opportunity. So, you know, there are people being left out, and then there are also, you know, businesses that are that are being left out, not so much because they haven't or didn't think of it, but because the model hasn't quite caught up yet in yeah. those markets. I think it will, um, but uh, I think there are opportunities, like there's that kind of like small, you know, microcosm of things day to day, and then I think there are these sort of bigger waves that are still yet to come. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I, I, just real quick, I, uh, we were doing some fundraising for um, my son's baseball team outside of uh, Stop and Shop, and you know, about half the people Oh, I don't have any cash on me, and I kept wishing I had one of those. Yes. Oh, yeah. oh we take credit cards. Yeah, Square. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yeah. Did you have something up there? No, the only the only thing I was going to add is that I just think that it's um, it's about just reinvention, and you know, so when you think about kind of healthcare industry or education, um, you're just going to see more mm -hmm. kind of these of these smaller companies coming in with a new way to think about it, mm -hmm. uh, and it's going to be exciting, but it's something that every single kind of traditional 
company needs to think about is, you know, what does the future look like for them and their brand, and what do they have to do to evolve to actually meet those needs? Right. And it's not always easy, because mm -hmm. the old way of doing it is often easier, and often the platforms don't scale that way. Mm -hmm. And so it's either kind of throwing away the old uh, system, which is hard to do, uh, and, um, and investing in something new or trying to bolt on. It's just not always easy, and so mm -hmm. kind of bringing a company along is, um, is hard to do. Well, and you're segueing me into another question, which is sort of, you know, what are the challenges that you feel that um, are kind of going to face the folks participating in these economies going forward? Well, I mean, the taxi industry is a great one, right? I mean, these, it, it's completely disrupted now, mm -hmm. completely disrupted, you know, by companies that have no taxis uh, and have no employees that are, you know, Right, driving these cars, it's it's fascinating, uh, and you kind of you got when you wake up, it might you might wake up a bit too late, and so there's just a lot of work that needs to be done around, um, you know, having incubators and uh, having just smart people trying to think about the challenge and and then you know testing and learning your way into it. Mm -hmm. I mean, there are ways to actually convert or save it. You just have to be willing to do it, mm -hmm. and not think that the old way is the best way. Mm -hmm. The incumbent, you know, doesn't always win. Just because they're big doesn't mean they're going to win. Right. Um, Bob, any challenges that you sort of see companies that they're going to be facing going forward? Yeah, I mean, some, some of this we've already seen. I, I, I don't know how big it will be as we go forward, but I think regulation will be one of the things mm -hmm. and, and um, whether or not government tries to get a cut of the action and, mm -hmm. and try to regulate some of these businesses. Um, you know, just the city governments looking at, you know, the Uber model and then saying, well, not here. We have, like, you know, regulations about taxis or... Um, Airbnb kind of facing the same thing. I know like even, you know, some of the buildings in San Francisco that are rentals, people, they kind of have a business going on where they rent a unit, never intending to live there, furnish it in a way that's very appealing, and then lease it um, out through Uber as part of the business model, and they'll go into then different buildings. And so even, you know, landlords are starting to clamp down on that, and the lease pr pro prohibits you from doing that because they don't really want that kind of turnover in the building. It creates a different community dynamic. Mm -hmm. um, and then uh, um, I think th when the other thing is, it, it, too, in San Francisco there's a, um, a service, and this is like an 18 and a 19-year-old um, two boys uh, develop this business model where, you know, because they notice like at any given time, the 30 airports, the 30 largest airports across the, the U.S., there are 360,000 cars sitting there idle. So they built a business model, an app, that when you drop your car off, that they'll bring you to the terminal, then your car is available for somebody else to use while you're on your trip. So San Francisco Airport said, no, we're shutting you down because we have rules and regulations about, you know, and we actually get a cut of the rental car business to let them be on the San Francisco Airport property. And they're saying, well, we're not a rental car company, so contractually, you know, we, you can't define us that way because that's, that's not who we are. So we, we shouldn't have to pay the tax. So I think those kinds of things, the, the, the regulation, I think, will be, conti you know, continuing to be a thing. Um, and especially as governments get in on the action, they're going to want some, you know, a cut of that that money that's coming that's mm -hmm. coming in. Mm -hmm. So, I think that's probably one. I think the other one is the um, in the in the space which I would call app pro <laughs> proliferation. Mm -hmm. I think it's for these companies that um, you know once they get sort of like the business model up and running is to remain distinctive and and to maintain a differential position. Uh, and, and to continue to be unique as the business model of, uh, evolves. I think that will be uh, a challenge as well. Mm -hmm. So you're both out west, and you both have the opportunity to see some things that we don't get to see, or at least I don't get to see. Yeah. Um, what are some exciting um, new things that you've seen in, in the digital or sharing space? Um, so I've seen some really cool stuff. Montree is a cool one that you've, you've already talked about, talked about shuttle. Um, do you guys know Dog Vacay? Um, this is so for all of you who have pets, you have a dog, uh, and you can't get home in the middle of the day to walk your dog. Um, there are these kind of dog walkers, it's this kind of shared economy dog walking service, but they also will board your dog for you. So instead of taking your dog to the border where your dog is sitting in a cage you know, all day long, your dog's actually sitting on someone's sofa uh, with maybe another, other, another dog. They're sending you videos of your dog and all the cool stuff that your dog did for the day. Um, you know, and, and, you know, so, but then they're getting all this data, so they're helping to like, um, you know, learn about kind of what's going on with 
uh, border collies and you know like all of this different interesting data but it's it's all about kind of this love that we have for our pets and this desire for our pet to live the life that it lives in your house when you're not there uh, and so you know the dog walker will take your dog and hang out at your house and then drop it off. I had a dog nanny when I was living in, uh, in Boston. It was my landlady, she watched my dog all day. But now these kind of folks just show up and watch your dog and take video and so you can sit at your desk and be like, oh, Fluffy had a great day today. <laughs> uh, you know, and, and here you go. Um, but so there's just so many of them. It's, mm -hmm. it's, it's fun to watch them and, um, and there's a lot. There's a lot of good stuff out there. It's just a matter of whether it scales and uh, whether it'll meet the needs all over, mm -hmm. all over the country, all over the world. Great. Well, the dog one I can relate to. I have two small dogs. I'm really cheap, and I'm like, how can I extract value from you two? Because you cost me a lot of money in vet bills and <laughs> grooming and whatever. But um, I, so I think you know that that's definitely one. And then Muntry is is kind of my other favorite one. And I already ordered like a roasted chicken for Saturday night dinner when I get home tomorrow. So um, that'll that'll be delivered at five o'clock. And again, there's no awkward money moment transaction because it's all done through the app. And so I get a text, and the driver says, you know, I'm within five minutes of of being to your door. And I text him back, and I'm like, great. And he shows up, and he's like, hands me the bag, and he goes. So it, it's you know, it has that seamless experience to it again. Um, and, and then I think that, you know, again, the car sharing thing, I have a car, I live in the city, we rarely use the car. I forget what the parking is, but it's a number that starts with a three or a four that's crazy um, to pay for the car to sit there. And then the insurance costs for the car, and the car is paid off, so there's not a payment. But still, I think about just the upkeep and the maintenance. Like, the one thing that kind of still, you know, I'm not ready, I think, yet to lease my car by the hour to strangers is, uh, you know, I don't want somebody smoking in my car. I don't want somebody with a big, hairy, wet collie in my car. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Nothing against those dogs, but I don't want it in my car. So I think, you know, like what happens to the dings and dents or things like that? And do people really have the responsibility for my car that I would, you know, mm -hmm. take with it? So um, those are those are some of my, uh, my, oh, and the laundry one too. I, that's like Washio and laundry locker and things like that. So, ballet is another yeah. cool one. Oh yes, ballet is, yes, absolutely. Well. You guys have been fantastic. Um, and I'm sure that these folks have a couple of questions for you. So let's open it up. We've got one right over here. So following up on your uh, example of sharing your car, I guess reputation is an important thing that a lot of these sharing business models have Absolutely. to deal with. So can you tell us on the East Coast what they're thinking on the West Coast as to how to get people to take care of each other in these peer-to-peer -peer economies, not trash your house when you use Airbnb or trash your car when, et cetera, take, take advantage great, of your that's dog. Such I don't a know great what, question. <laughs> yeah. It's a great question because I, reputation is a huge um, component uh, that underlies all of these, these kind of sharing apps. And I, I didn't even realize until recently, and it was one of the Uber drivers that I was chatting with, told me that I actually get rated by Uber, Uber drivers. Yeah. I, I never do that, so I thought that was kind of interesting. Because I, like anybody else, sometimes I can have a bad day and be a little bit more demanding and want to go a certain route. Um, but, <laughs> um, cause I, so I think it is interesting that that is built into the platform. and. When I think about some of the earlier models like Zipcar, um, which was, you know, not, that was like, that was more, I think, of a collaborative sort of sharing, sharing system, but it wasn't, it was somebody owned the vehicle. So that, that's a little bit different than now. It's like, you know, my vehicle. And I think that's the thing that polices, you know, against my fears. But, you know, in the early stage, like if you're one of the first ins, you still have the potential that somebody's gonna be in there who isn't rated yet, mm -hmm. um, who does the wrong things with your car. And, and rating is, I mean, it's a, it goes back for so long now, right? So eBay with the rating system 20 years ago, um, and they're always optimizing the rating system uh, and uh, ensuring that it's always fair uh, because, you know, there's always retaliation and all these other things, but the rating system ends up working uh, and, and people really care about it, right? You know, so I, yeah, I'd have people say, oh, I'm a power seller or, you know, I've, I have all five stars and, and all of these things that it ends up being a, uh, badge of honor and pride, uh, and so when you when you keep those robust and you keep the algorithm really tight, 
um, it, it ends up helping. It doesn't fix everything because there's always going to be the bad seed, uh, but the community ends up working together to create kind of a, a great experience for everyone. Great. There was another question. Oh, you had one? I'm sorry. Thanks. Um, what do you see from a financial or the economic perspective for this? So one of the interesting things is that eBay, uh, obviously the prices were, were set by the, the customers actually selling, or the sellers, right? Um, and the same in some other models like eBay. And somewhat if you're an Amazon seller, you set your price. If you're uh, selling on Etsy, you're setting your own price. As opposed to the Uber model, where Uber used to be quite expensive and then they got into price wards and have been coming lower and lower and lower. Um, or uh, uh, Washio, right, which I've, I've looked into Washio <laughs> and said, I'll keep doing my own laundry. Um, uh, and, and then other things like the, I have a car in Boston, I think I drive it once a month. I've looked into to, uh, the financials of, of having um, rally rides use it. Um, and then also saw that they could, their terms said they could drive it up to 10,000 miles a month. I was like, no, 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 <laughs> like you're not paying me enough for 10,000 miles a month. So what do you think about the economics of it? Uh, are they going to, to slide closer and closer to essentially being a, a pretty equalized commodity price with just the, the app provider getting a slight, slight benefit? Or, or are there some ways to, to keep the model pretty distinctive where whoever it is, whether it's Uber or someone else, can, can keep a healthy profit? I think there's a, an element of that that's just basic um, supply and demand and how many competitors there are in the marketplace. And, and so I think, you know, Washio and Laundry Locker, uh, you know, there's competition in the marketplace. So a Laundry Locker used to be really, really expensive and their prices, their prices for the washing piece of things um, have come down. And they incentivize you to include dry cleaning so then you get even cheaper on the laundry price per pound. You can tell that I use this stuff. But um, I, I think that that's part of it. And, and to some extent, I think you know, Uber, where they, when they first launch on a market, they have more pricing power because they're the only player there and people are willing to pay. Um, and then you see other players like Flywheel come into the market or, or Lyft come into the market. And then their, their prices um, begin to, to adjust to be able to, be, to remain competitive. Um, so I think that to some degree it will be, it will be driven by, and the other thing is I think it, as, you, if you, as you get the democratization of these kinds of services that people may be willing to pay some degree of a premium. It's still not the same um, as if I have to do it myself um, or as if I have to go and hire somebody to do this personally for me, which is you know, kind of a hassle to do that. Um, and I'm willing to pay a slight premium to be able to make that happen. I, I agree. I think I think it's gonna. It's all about supply and demand, uh, and I think the competitive environment actually helps to define kind of some of those costs. Even on the eBay side, right? You, you said you know, the custom, the seller gets to decide the price, but the market actually ends up deciding the price, right? You know, so if you price it too high, it's just not going to sell. Uh, mm -hmm. And you know, one of the things we found is a new sellers always think their stuff is a whole lot more valuable than it really is. Uh, and I fell into that game too, where I had a gorgeous Diane von Furstenberg dress that I'd never worn. I wanted to sell it for the price I bought it for, and it still had the tags on it. And the community was like, mm -mm. you know, I'm not gonna buy it for that. And, you know, you mark it down a bit and it, and it ends up selling. But if it's a, you know, iPhone 6 and they came out yesterday, and you know, there's a seller on eBay that has a whole bunch of them, the price is gonna be crazy. Uh, and it's just because the demand is so high and the inventory is so low. Um, that it can demand the price, and then it ends up adjusting over the weeks. And so um, I think supply and demand and the market will continue to, to help to decide. The competitive environment actually kind of makes that, you know, the rise, but uh, ultimately it, it balances out. Great. I'm looking for Tracy to see if I can allow one more question as I snubbed the young man in the front here earlier. One more? <laughs> Go ahead. <laughs> Unintentionally. Hello, yeah. Um, my question is, um, in your view, what you, how much influence do you think um, economic conditions um, help with these business models um, coming up? I look back and see um, most of these businesses like Airbnb, Uber started around 2008, 
And that was the time the world um, financial crisis started. And I think people had assets, they had acquired assets uh, that they had to monetize to be able to pay for those assets. And people also um, were, had income, their disposable incomes being narrowed. And so we're finding cheaper alternatives to services they were already enjoying. So um, huh? up in your view, how much influence do you think these economic conditions um, add, added to these business models starting? Yeah, great question. I, I think it's, um, I think the economic conditions play a lot into it. And I actually think that's why the Valley is an interesting test case, right? So the Valley's still hot, there's a whole lot of money, real estate's really high, uh, and people are paying cash for houses and you know, overbidding by 200,000. Like, so you think about that market, um, it's really hot, there's a lot of money there. And so all these companies start in that environment. And that's why I think it's a weird test bed because we don't represent the world and we mm -hmm. don't represent the country. Uh, and so, um, and so, a lot of these um, companies may not survive as you scale it. But I do think that um, um, what's going on with the economy and you know how much disposable income people have will determine what lives and what doesn't live. Mm -hmm. It's a great okay. question. Great. Anyone else? Thank you. Oh, um, I, I believe I'm being told that I need to wrap it up. Okay. <laughs> 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 Thank you. Thank you Thank both. You. you were Thank fantastic. You. Thank you. Thank you.